This is a production of Cornell University. So I'm going to talk today, run through fairly quickly a whole bunch of different directions. Uh, the introduction said I've investigated numerous angles, and so you're going to see a little bit of a lot of different angles in this talk. Um, so broccoli production in the Northeast, of course, I'm betraying my California upbringing in pursuing this topic at all. Um, but it turns out to be uh, a really interesting one with a lot of potential in various different directions. So why would one care about broccoli production in the Northeast? So we've got a number of different things happening right now that kind of makes this uh, a compelling thing to pursue. So I think you're all aware that locally grown is a big deal. Everybody's talking about locally grown produce as being something attractive, and that is showing up in the marketplace as uh, the supermarkets and wholesalers are starting to think about how can I get local product into my store? Where can I source it? Who can I buy it from? Uh, we've, despite the lower diesel prices this year, for the past several years, diesel has been very expensive. That's made transportation from California very expensive. In fact, the wholesale price of broccoli and much other produce on the East Coast, half of that cost is the transportation and half of it is the cost that was paid in California. Uh, that cost has not come down with the diesel price, by the way. It's still the same high price. So that's a barrier that provides an opportunity uh, to make money for growers. Um, we're looking at reducing the carbon footprint, so shipping uh, 10,000 pounds of broccoli and 10,000 pounds of ice across the country has a substantial footprint, not only with the diesel, but the ice. Uh, we can reduce that. Our uh, vegetable growers uh, value diversification on their farms, value diversification on what they're selling, so both in the rotation and economically diversification is good. Uh, and also, as we've noticed with the shortage of water in California this year, that having our production diversified around the country can help provide, we're calling it food security for the United States, that we don't fall short of crops that we really like during periods when the one location that it's grown, something's happening there that prevents us from getting it. So there's a number of angles to why we would want to uh, be looking at broccoli in the Northeast right now. Why broccoli? People love broccoli. Who ate broccoli in the last month? <laughs> yeah, how about the last week? We've probably got some vegetables. Look at that, yeah. So everybody eats broccoli just about, right? It's a very, very popular crop. And so this, this chart shows how the broccoli consumption per capita has been going up. Of course, the population's going up too. Uh, the interesting thing to me is down here at 1970, we're about half a pound per person a year. That's not very much. It was an Italian specialty vegetable pretty much in the 1960s. It really only became sort of something everybody ate relatively recently. And um, so there, there's a big upside for Kale, by the way, it's a, a half now. After the burst in the last few years, it's gone from a quarter to a half, so it's really gone way up. But <laughs> you, can, you can imagine the trajectory over the next several years. Uh, so there's only upside potential. So where do we grow broccoli now? Well, we grow it in California, of course, is the answer. Uh, so this shows you uh, it, the big numbers are how many acres of production there are in each part, so you see on the coast in the summer, in the desert in the winter time, and a little smattering on the east coast. And when you get to the very northernmost county where it's good and cold, uh, there's a little patch there, um, a little winter production down there. But really, it's a little smattering. And in fact, I think we have worked with each of the farms that represents a dot <laughs> in this map. Uh, so there's, there's potential for increasing that on the, on the east coast. Uh, so why can't we do that simply? Well, first of all, the varieties that exist are poorly adapted to our eastern growing conditions. Temperature, water, humidity, are, and variability in all of the above are really big challenges. And so what's been done to date is to raise broccoli where the conditions are optimal for it. And that has worked, but as demand goes up, we need to find more places. Uh, the other 
significant obstacle is that for any one location, we have a relatively short harvest season. So here it would basically be September right now. You can grow broccoli just fine if you harvest in September. The problem is that your customers need broccoli 12 months out of the year, and they're not going to abandon their reliable supplier for a month to take your stuff. That's the grower's dilemma. So supplying year-round turns out to be a very important uh, element of getting into the market. And because of that situation, the distribution network for growers throughout the East is not really set up to handle a product uh, with a fresh market product with this volume. So just getting it from the producers to the stores. The very common question from farmers, I can grow it just fine, but who do I sell it to? Very common question from retail produce uh, buyers. We really want local broccoli, but we can't find anybody to raise it for us. So this seems like a dilemma that can be overcome, and it turns out this distribution network is the problem. So where do we start? Well, of course, you start with breeding and improving the crop, because that's what we're really good at, and I'll talk in more detail about that. Uh, but breeding a better crop doesn't help unless the farmers can buy the seed of it, right? That's where the rubber meets the road, you can buy the seed. If there's only 6,000 acres of broccoli in the East, the seed companies don't care. They're not going to spend money on developing varieties, marketing them, releasing them, raising seed, and selling those seed if there's only a few growers. So they haven't been motivated to do anything at all. That's been a big obstacle. So we've tried to put together a project where we can tempt them with the promise of having a lot more acreage in the East so it's worth their while. And so this promise of volume markets has developed the promise of potentially having a lot more Eastern growers, more seed sales, and seed company interest. And so just to show you what the what the problem looks like. Uh, with warm nights, not enough chilling hours to put it roughly. For those of you who've taken plant physiology, you recognize that system. So the flower buds need cool temperatures to decide to develop, and obviously that didn't happen uh, at the right time in this one. And so you have some very teeny tiny floral primordia there and some big flower buds there that managed to squeak through while it was still cool. Uh, so that's what a Western adapted variety looks like here in the summertime. This is a variety that was bred for growing in warmer summer conditions. Uh, probably nobody would buy this unless it was a friend who was selling it to you. Right? Uh, and this is Pac-Man. This is the variety that Eastern broccoli production was based on for about 20 years until maybe 5 or 10 years ago. Uh, it still looks pretty rough. You can sell that in some markets, but certainly not in the supermarket trade or the restaurant trade. So we need to have varieties that look better than that. So that's our, the physiological goal and the breeding goal of the project. So I want to run through really quickly some of uh, the physiology we did a number of years ago, because in case you've forgotten or are not yet aware, uh, because we're going to be picking up on, on this uh, soon. So in development, you have vegetative meristem. You recognize a little dome on top there. Uh, at a certain point, the flowering reproductive transition comes along, and so now you have a reproductive meristem. You can tell the difference. The main difference is this one's about twice as big, and there's a little flat spot right there where it's starting to develop a reproductive meristem. Here, little whirls of reproductive meristems are being produced. So each of the new knobs is another reproductive meristem. And that gets bigger. You see little bracts coming up at the base of some of the whirls. And then on the rightmost figure, you see that there's a little ring around the top of some of these. Those are now floral primordia. Those little things at the edges are sepal primordia. So they're starting to differentiate eighth into flowers, which means they're not making more meristems. This just keeps going and going. So if it doesn't get enough chilling hours during this period, that's when the transition to these little floral meristems doesn't quite happen. Uh, so this is an inflorescence meristem. Uh, looks like cauliflower. It's 
green, but it looks like cauliflower, right? This is the floral primordia, just to show you you can get a good sized head consisting of nothing but floral primordia, arrested in development. Um, the inset shows them a little bit bigger. And there's the, it's gone all the way to flower buds. Uh, so you may ask, what's the genetic difference between these? Because, you know, if we had the gene, we could solve it. Well, all three of those pictures are taken from exactly the same genotype. It's an F1 hybrid commercial green cauliflower variety called Green Harmony. It's widely raised in Asia. It's an F1 hybrid. They're all the same. The difference is the temperature. So its gene expression is very important. What triggers gene expression after a certain number of uh, chilling hours are uh, accumulated? So. We'll take a quick look at that. So leafy is a gene that usually if it turns on, that's when you start getting the floral differentiation. And here you can see a vegetative meristem. The, so the white speckles are where the gene is being expressed. So it's low in the vegetative one, starts to get higher right in the outside surface of those uh, reproductive meristems. And then when it goes to flower buds, uh, it actually looks a little bit lower, which it stays high at that point in Arabidopsis, so it's a little different. So Denise Duclos is a graduate student here um, who looked at a whole set of candidate genes that we believed from Arabidopsis work uh, would tell us where the level of control was. And we found many genes that didn't do anything interesting at all, even though we expected them to. Uh, but there were a couple, so leafy, when the transition from the uh, floral primordia to the flowers, uh, the leafy drops off. And when you have the earlier transition, we see that the uh, apetal A1, which is the petal designating uh, gene, turns on. Uh, so we have a couple of transitions. So the question is, what leads up to that? And so we compared as development proceeds or the expression levels of uh, so we see leafy stops at this one, and AP1 turns off there. We have another one called fruitful that was doing some interesting things. Uh, so to go to the next step, we're asking what regulates these. But when you compare broccoli with what's going on in Arabidopsis, we were not encouraged to say, well, it happens this way in Arabidopsis, so therefore it must be happening the same way in broccoli. They're just not being expressed at the same stages, and it's a very complex network. Uh, that leads up to that. And we ended up having uh, a very large number of candidate genes to try to pursue a candidate gene approach. So that effort more or less stopped at that point. And the, uh, given the situation, the next step is really to pick it up at the genomics level where you can look at all of the genes you don't have to know in advance. Uh, and look at what that variation is. So that is a direction that Zach Stansel will be pursuing here. If you went to grad review, you saw some of the populations that he has available uh, to him to begin that. So that'll be continuing onward. Um, but then we come to the Eastern Broccoli Project, which funded no molecular work whatsoever. Uh, but many other things. So this is a project that was funded by the Specialty Crops Research Initiative. Uh, and it had a goal of having year-round broccoli production of a quality that consumers want. Uh, and so here are sort of the harvest seasons starting in Maine, New York going south. We've got the mountains of Ken Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, and then uh, South Georgia and Florida are sort of the different production areas we're looking at, and the harvest season in each of those. And one of the things you can see is that there is gaps. Even when we've got all the production areas going, there are still gaps in the production season. And so the goal is to expand each of those production seasons by increasing the environmental uh, adapt adaptation of the broccoli so that we can go wider and have them overlap a little bit. Um, so to realize the, oper the uh, well, the, the oper I guess to find the year-round production, uh, we need not only the varieties that have the right traits, we need the 
really wide adaptability, so that's a trait of sorts, but uh, it's really a fundamental behavior of the plant. Uh, we need to get the varieties released. The seed companies need to be producing the seeds, selling the seeds of them. Uh, we need a grower base that can expand. So people who are expert at growing vegetables, uh, but not currently doing broccoli, how can they start doing broccoli? Where does that make sense for them? Um, th and looking at the supply so that we're having enough broccoli coming on the market to meet the demand, but not so much that it depresses the price. And finding that balance is actually not only challenging, but very location specific. You can tank the price in one market and have a shortage in another one just a few hundred miles away. Uh, and then finally make sure that the, the product that's raised in the East is valued by the consumers uh, and by the, uh, really the produce managers. They're a real uh, uh, roadblock in this one. So we set up uh, a set of six objectives in the project uh, to try to hit all of those. And I'll talk a little bit about most of them. And so you may not even be able to read that, but this is uh, some of the team that was working together. And so we had a breeding group, uh, nutritional quality. We don't want to have the broccoli be less healthy. That would be rude. Uh, the <laughs> big regional trial system in many locations. We were looking at uh, economics, uh, both national market systems and consumer decision making. Uh, we have a team from the seed companies who are responsible for commercialization, uh, a number of different farms, an extension team to make sure that the uh, growers had appropriate guidance, and then a bunch of distribution and retail. It turns out it's, it's not like this one big flow of broccoli. There's hundreds of different markets, all with their own expectations. So we try to uh, represent a lot of those. And so a lot of integration with industry in this project. So looking at the breeding element of it, so we want to improve the public sector germplasm. The, in the public sector, there's a lot of opportunity to make improvements that don't make sense for the companies, uh, especially bringing in uh, more unusual traits or starting with uh, material that's a little bit more odd than commercial material. Uh, we also want to discover the best seed company germplasm. They've got lots of packets of seeds stashed away that didn't have enough market potential before, but maybe it does now. Let's find it. Uh, we want to combine the excellent traits that are in the commercial germplasm with the new traits that would come out of a public program. Uh, we want to understand the quantitative genetics of the traits. These are difficult traits, and understanding how they behave and interact uh, is important for making progress. Uh, nicking trials for hybrid production. Uh, not all couples are made in heaven when it comes to broccoli, so some of them are very productive of seeds, some are not. If you're a seed company, seeds are your product, so if you have a hybrid that you want to sell in the plant that just doesn't make a lot of seeds, well, that's, that's low productivity. That's a really big problem. So it turns out that the hybrids you see on the market are from very fecund uh, parental pairs. Uh, so we have three public programs. So Griff's is one of them here at Cornell. Uh, and uh, Mark Farnham with ARS <coughs> at Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, Jim Myers at Oregon State, who's been breeding for uh, really the processing industry as well as for organic production. So we wanted to bring that in. And then three private programs, the seed companies, Bayo, Syngenta, and Seminis were the ones who elected to join us. And as the person trying to get all these people to talk to each other in common language, we find that each of the breeding programs has a very distinct way of going about things, uh, different populations, different goals. Uh, so one of the uh, techniques was to try to encourage them to compete a little bit with one another. So we have a regional trial program, so trying to make sure that everybody feels uh, the competitive urge to have the best material in the regional trial. Uh, that uh, proved helpful. But then at the same time, uh, we want them to collaborate with each other to generate cross-program results that are 
uh, even better. Uh, and then we really want to get the public material licensed so that growers can get it. Uh, licensing is, is how it's done these days, but having the public material then go to a seed company in one of many forms uh, and uh, become available and provide revenue to keep uh, these breeding programs going. Um, so there are the breeders, I mentioned them. So here are the traits that the new varieties need. So you notice it's a long list for starters. Uh, I'll only mention briefly, we need the stability across environments, wide adaptation, uh, because in any given location you're going to have a lot of variation in the weather and you don't know how to predict it. If you remember 365 days ago, what kind of jacket were you wearing and what are you wearing today? That's normal variation. Uh, we need the uniform bead, so that's really genetically a chill requirement. Uh, we need a, a good dome on it, and that's just so the rain falls off. That's all, <laughs> all you need that for. But you can have a relatively flat head in California. It doesn't matter. We need one that sheds rain so it doesn't rot. Uh, we want to make sure it has all the ingredients that make it healthy. Uh, the market likes really small flower buds right now, but really small flower buds are difficult to hide uneven flower buds behind. The big ones hide stuff a lot better. Uh, so how much do you need that? It needs to look really green because people buy broccoli because it's healthy. Green is healthier, right? Everybody. Uh, works that way in their head. And this turns out to be not just chlorophyll content, but wax structure on the surface, what color anthocyanins. So there's a lot that goes into the uh, green. So all of these are complex traits. There's not a single gene trait in the bunch. So figuring out how to pile all these together uh, is no small matter. Uh, and to really address the, the first one in particular, we've set up a system of regional trials where we are testing the material in very different locations. So we want to identify the wide adaptation to the east. Uh, we want to collect a data set where we can start to understand the genetic control of some of these traits. There's huge environmental effect on essentially all of them, and there is a substantial genotype by environment interaction. So to figure out anything at all, you need massive data sets. Uh, we particularly want to understand the variation in nutritional quality because that, that's, again, a feature people like. We do see quite a lot of environmental variation. Um, you see the Beneforte broccoli. It's being sold as a uh, uh, glucoraphanin enhanced broccoli type. And they don't tell you what concentration it is because it varies quite a lot with the growing conditions. They say it contains four times as much as normal broccoli. And that's entirely true. If you grow a regular variety and Beneforte next to each other, the Beneforte generally runs about four times as high. But how much the absolute number uh, depends on the environment. So we've got a lot of variation there. Um, we're trying to identify where different germplasm has complementary traits. So you get one with a great dome and one that's really green, but you're not getting any that have both, for instance. And uh, and we want the companies to buy and license the public sector material. Uh, so the, these regional trials, they were set up in three phases. The first one, we allow lots and lots of entries. We're essentially culling at that stage. We're only, we've got five locations, two plantings at each location, so lots of observations on those, um, but not a huge investment in them. Uh, so that's an effective culling step, and that's where we can attract uh, so anything a breeder thinks might look interesting. It doesn't have to win, it just needs a chance to win. Then we have a much more elaborate stability trial. Here we have uh, five plantings at four locations, but that way we try many different times during the season uh, and really get a sense of how it behaves. We get vast variation in what happens. We try to hit a stressful time and a non-stressful time, and sometimes nature cooperates. This is also where we look at the nutritional studies. Uh, and finally, we go to looking at commercial yields, where we're on grower farms, seeing how they, uh, how they actually behave, what kind of yield are they, are they going to make money, uh, you know, the, how much does it cost to harvest them, do you have to go in three times or seven times, that makes a big difference. Uh, 
We spent a lot of time standardizing across locations. So we had little diagrams for how to score different things. Uh, we got together and made sure everybody sat in the same room and looked at broccoli heads. Oh, is this a three for green or a four for green? We talked about that for a long time. Uh, to make sure that everybody was scoring the same way at each location because we're trying to compare numbers across locations. So having that be standardized was really important. So some of the stuff that comes out of it, just a little glimpse we can do. Uh, this, this is an association uh, among the different traits that we scored. Uh, and so each of this are a scatter plot of uh, how the two traits are related to each other. So here's an example of firmness and bead size. Usually smaller flower buds make the head firmer and it is sturdier. And you can see that there's a very strong positive relationship there. So the, a lot of the firmness is actually caused by the flower buds being small. So that's what you would expect, not surprising. You have some other ones. Uh, so plot uniformity is the plant to plant variation um, is not at all associated with firmness. You probably wouldn't expect them to be. Uh, but so there's, you find some are completely unrelated. And then one, as I just implied, small beaded ones, it's harder to hide non-uniformity. And so you'd expect a strong negative correlation there, that the small beaded stuff tends to look less uniform. And sure enough, that's a negative relationship. But the, the way to look at that is, hey, there's some here that have small beads and look uniform. Great. So breeders are great at tossing out the junk and looking at only the good stuff. And so that's what happens here is you keep the good stuff. Uh, and then in comparing the material over these many sites, you have to really uh, condense the information. So we ended up using spider plots as one way to describe it. So each of the axes is a different trait. And they're grouped a little bit. So we've got firmness, bead size, bead uniformity are the first three. So those are important traits that are difficult to get. The dome is also important and uh, sensitive to heat a lot of the time. Then head uniformity, color, uh, head expression, how far it comes up, plot uniformity, and holding time, uh, which you can see is uh, sensitive green is uh, grown in cool conditions, red in hot conditions. So green magic is, when we started, was the most common variety in the East. Marathon was the most common variety in the world. You can see that uh, it goes down to horrible low numbers when it's warm. Uh, Iron Man was being sold for being tough. That's how it got its name. Uh, the red line is a lot smaller than the green line. Uh, Castle Dome was another standard we looked at. So this was from the second year breeding trials. Uh, we've got some that uh, are fair in the heat sensitive traits, but really do very nicely in everything else. Others that have really quite high numbers uh, in the heat sensitive traits and are not too bad in the other ones. So we're able to uh, look over the different materials. And so uh, skipping several years ahead now. Uh, so this is, this is the slide that I'm actually very excited about. So how fast is the breeding progress when you're working with very complicated traits? Well, if you're working with talented breeders who know the art of breeding, progress is fast. So on our rating system, uh, a three was generally set at where the minimum commercial quality is. So if it's a three, you can probably sell it if everything else is okay. And four was considered really good commercial quality. We went to five because some of the traits go beyond that. And so here, uh, I put the axis at three because it's the minimum and the top at four because that's what we ultimately want to see. Each of these bars um, is uh, the average of 120 data points. So they're pretty uh, strong as far as variation. So the red lines are the standards. So it's the same varieties every time, five different standards that are averaged together. And the green are the five best lines in our phase one trial. So when we started, this was material that was, people had it, they thought it might be good. 
Uh, so the best of those, you see that they're a little bit improved in the uniform bead, a little bit smoother dome. The dome stays okay, and they're a little bit greener. So that's what we started with, and three years of breeding later, now the uniform bead is well into the commercial range. Uh, the, the dome is still well into the commercial range here on smoothness. We've maintained the dome, haven't given up on that, and they're much greener. So we've had remarkable progress here. Uh, so we've had, and there's further crosses being made. So the anticipation is that this will continue up. But to be able to go from barely commercial to really well towards having everything hit commercial a lot of the time, it's a tremendous advance on the breeding end. Uh, so to do that as a, a picture, we've gone from this in August to this in August. This one happens to be one of Mark's, but Griff has lines that also look like this in the summertime. So that you can sell. And that is what the seed companies are interested in commercializing. Um, Conventional mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, So the material that we started with here in the early one, that is what has become released as commercial varieties. And so they've been in the yield trials. So just to show you graphically the, how the yield trials were laid out with the different production areas on the x-axis here in the year on the, or on the year on the x-axis, the different uh, locations on the y-axis. Uh, but how you try to fit so that the growth happens when it's warm enough but it's done and ready to harvest before it gets either too hot or too cold, uh, depending on which end of the season you're on. So we tried to fit the different locations. You can see we go from very cold areas to the very warm areas to try to cover the whole season. Uh, and these yield trials have, have shown that the new material is uh, stable and superior in each in their own locations. We've had six varieties released by the seed companies in the first four years of the project and are expecting a couple more to come out this growing season. Um, so the, you know, based on the early stuff, so the better, the better stuff is on the way. It's in, the, in their pipeline. Uh, but I think that is a great result, just thinking about uh, in your own research, what's the mechanism from getting it from your lab to industry, so it's for sale in the marketplace. There's an awful lot of steps, an awful lot of time. So seeing this much progress in, in four years uh, is really uh, remarkable, and that's the, the breeders uh, and seed companies in the project that have moved it along like that. Uh, so then we come to the growers. Where are the growers going to be, and how can we uh, fit the new varieties in and look at how where we can stretch the season a little bit. Uh, where should we encourage new production? And one of the elements of looking at that is to look at climate data. We've got tremendous resources in climate data, so we can look at some uh, patterns to try to guess where it might fit well. And so I first do sort of a rough picture here. I'm using Salinas where the production is currently. I'm using as a proxy the mean minimum temperature. What we actually use in the model is number of days that the nighttime temperature exceeds 65 degrees, uh, but that's much harder to draw. Uh, so just the mean minimum temperature uh, on actually a daily basis. Uh, and so you can see Salinas is pretty flat. So blue here is where it's really too cold for it to grow. Red is where it's too warm for it to grow. Or for it to produce nice heads. Uh, so the eastern location in Caribou, Maine, up there in the north, uh, they have similarly cool middle of summer. That's why they can produce it in the middle of summer, but very different pattern there in the continental climate. If you look at Geneva, you see that we're warmer than Maine uh, and just touches that red zone in a tantalizing sort of way. Western New York is very productive for coal crop production. Uh, so a little bit of improvement uh, and we can uh, probably do a lot. 
So what about nearby areas? So as an example, I'll use Fremont, Ohio. It's on the southern shore of Lake Erie, or, so it's not that different. It's just a little bit further south. And so you can see they pop up into the red area quite a bit. And so it's actually quite a lot less suitable. You'd have to make pretty big uh, changes in the temperature uh, tolerance of broccoli to go to that area. So if we look at the harvest season, Salinas actually harvests from April through November, and then they move down to the desert. Uh, if you look at Maine, they actually start harvesting in July, and they go until early October, or whenever they get frozen out. So you see that's quite a bit shorter season. I've got up here sort of my guess is what the harvest season would be. Uh, if you look at New York, uh, that slope is steep, right? That's our problem. It's changing fast. And what we know is that there's a lot of variability in that. But that's uh, what our harvest season can look like. And you see that that Fremont, Ohio is steeper still. And it, it's not so much that they're warmer, it's that they're steeper that makes it a problem. So their, their season is quite a bit shorter too. Uh, so that's going to be a challenge. The other issue we deal with is rainfall. So this is this past June. Do you remember June? <laughs> uh, so that, that's a deadly amount of water. The roots need to breathe. Those roots are not breathing. Uh, and I like to compare broccoli production to dragster racing. If you miss a shift in dragster racing, you're kind of out of the picture. It doesn't matter. And it's the same thing with broccoli. And this is a missed shift. Uh, it isn't making the transition from newly transplanted to rapid growth uh, quickly, and uh, that ends up being a big problem, and you'll get to see a little bit how big. Uh, so in looking at also at the growers, how should they produce broccoli uh, to make it profitable? Uh, it has to be more profitable than whatever they're growing now, and we need some hard numbers on that and some production systems. One thing I uh, noted is that uh, with cabbage, which is very similar to broccoli in many ways, uh, we produce about 50 to 55 tons per acre in New York. In the southeast on much lighter soils, are around 30 tons an acre. Uh, and yet both locations are producing uh, typically 400 to 450 boxes an acre, about half of California. So if you monkeyed around with the growing a little bit, could you move Western New York production a little bit closer to California than it is in Georgia? And so we tried some nutrition and particularly plant population changes. So the traditional population here is uh, similar to other transplanted vegetable crops, maybe 14, 15, 16,000 plants per acre. So we're going with some higher numbers here. So here, there's the rows are 15 inches apart, and there's a the, every fourth row is skipped, and they're either six, eight, or 12 inches apart in the row. Um, we know that there are production systems that will will pack them even as tight as this 52,000 population. So this is two weeks after transplanting. What they should look like? They're filling in in the row for the most part, uh, except for the 12 inch one. Uh, three weeks, you've got a pretty solid stand. Uh, here, uh, four and a half weeks. This is about when the herbicide wears off. So, you know, weed management is one of the big problems. So, if your herbicide wears off and the weeds start germinating at this point, how big a problem are the weeds going to be? Uh, they basically don't stand a chance. The root, the broccoli roots fill the entire soil, and there's no light coming to the ground. So. Weed management really works out nice if you have this kind of growth. Um, and 52 days is when harvest begins. Uh, so on this one, you can see it's a little bit lighter green because the uh, nitrogen is moving towards the heads. In fact, a few little leaves that were shaded out, they're moving the nitrogen up into the head. So doing very high fertility production, but not excessive fertility. Uh, nitrogen is being used effectively. So what happens uh, in terms of productivity with these. So here's a graph of the cumulative yields. So the uh, lowest population does uh, 
exactly what experience has been with low populations. Uh, it starts to produce. You do three cuts, and you've got uh, a yield here. We got about 550 because we're doing uh, high fertility there. So we beat the state average on that one. With the intermediate population, there's about a five-day delay in maturity, so you're giving up something there. But there's more plants that produce heads, uh, so you're putting up the yield close to 700 on that one. When they were packed tighter, then they started competing with each other. So even though they were only delayed a few more days, uh, they start pooping out. And so there's a lot of plants that don't make anything harvestable at all. So they were too tight. Uh, so we found that moving up into the 30s, 30,000 something, uh, is going to be a lot better than 15,000, which is where people generally are now. Uh, found with quality, so I used a hollow, this is hollow stem here, a hollow stem susceptible variety uh, in this trial. Uh, it's a delicious tasting one, so it's popular for that. Uh, and it's basically how thick the stem is determines whether the pith is going to open up. And so if you look at the head weight, these are all five inch heads. So the heavier heads are the ones that have the thicker stems. That's the dimension that's changing. Uh, and at the low population, we're getting big thick stems with lots of hollow stem. At the highest population, we're getting undersized heads. We want to try to keep them close to 0.2 kilos. Uh, so the intermediate population not only gave the highest yield, it gave the highest quality. So this tells us what the optimal population should look like. And so growers can find uh, what their own is. But I said, we're doing this to see when you make money. So let's do the numbers on that. Uh, so 2013 was an excellent year for growing broccoli. Uh, it did very well. The green curve is the revenue. The red curve is the total cost. And we're figuring everything, owning the tractors, the barns, interest payments, all of that stuff. So this is not marginal cost. It's total cost. Uh, by way of comparison, good corn crop is worth $600, $700. It's way down there. Uh, so this is very big money compared with uh, even some profitable crops. Uh, so the low population make pretty good money. Intermediate population make even more money. 2014 was a challenging year. We had a hailstorm come through just before heading. Another m uh, missed shift, if you will, uh, where the plants really were shocked. They stopped growing for several days just from the physical shock of the the hailstorm. Uh, so we had lower yields then. Uh, but if you look at those differences where the profit is, that intermediate population still made good money. Going with a lower population just barely broke even. And even that one is higher than the industry standard. So moving those populations up is going to make broccoli a lot more economically attractive. So 2015, I showed you what 2015 looks like. It was a terrible, terrible year. So what happens when you have a terrible year with that huge investment? Well, the costs are still high. And at the lower population, it still pulled it out. It turned out to be all bunching broccoli instead of crown broccoli. Uh, so the highest population lost money. But the grower still doesn't lose a ton of money, even when there's a really disastrous event. So Sometimes you don't, you don't make much money, but at least you don't you, know, you have $6,000 an acre at risk there. So uh, coming out even with that one is actually pretty good news in a terrible year. Uh, so to continue down the line of the economic analysis uh, for uh, making that money, here's the price per box over the last five years uh, at Eastern Terminal Markets. So the, Prices vary all over the place depending on how you're, uh, who you're selling it to. But the terminal market price at least is basically the same thing all the time. So you know what's going on there. And they're reported every week. So you can get the numbers on them. Uh, looked at the blue line is a bunch 
and the green line is a crown. The market is more and more crown cut. There's a few holdouts that are still doing bunches. Uh, the Southeast, which is very conservative in their food tastes. New York City, which apparently is very conservative in its food tastes. If you want to draw that inference. Uh, and uh, organic tends to go with a bunch. But the bulk of the market these days is crown. You can see that there used to be a differential between the two, but for the last few years, that's pretty much gone. Uh, the price jumps around a lot from year to year. So if you're a grower going into a spot market like this, uh, it can be very hard to budget. And so it's really important to make sure that uh, at $14, $15, you're making money. And sometimes you make a lot of money, but you don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, some years there's a transition right around uh, New Year's that often uh, comes as they're switching over production uh, from Salinas to the desert. And sometimes uh, there's a big extra supply coming out of Mexico right around then uh, that they're trying to catch that. So we looked at the total production costs for the East to see how they compare with California. And we looked at some models. And the, the numbers came in remarkably similar. They're all like $11. I'd put several dollars of error bars on each of these because it depends so much locally. Uh, but these numbers are definitely competitive. But what goes into those varies a great deal. Uh, that the cost structure, so California water costs a lot. Here water comes down free, power sometimes too much, but it comes down free. Land is very expensive in California. Land is not very expensive here. Uh, Labor is much more difficult to get here. So there's, there's significant differences. And one of the big variables, so yeah, so I'll remind you, so the price chart, $15, production costs 11 so that's kind of where your potential profit margin is. One of the big variables is the post-harvest costs. So broccoli is all really rapidly growing tissue, right? It's respiring like crazy. And so if you take a bunch of broccoli that's at out in the sunshine, and you put it in a box, and you put a bunch of boxes together, and they're all busy respiring at a very high temperature, what's going to happen? They're going to get hot. They're going to turn yellow. They're going to burn up all their sugar. They're going to be awful. So it has to get cold really quickly. And there's been a lot of work done on this. And cold means 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't mean 38 degrees. 38 degrees, rapid, rapid enough respiration to cost a lot of quality from the farm uh, to the buyer. So getting it cold is critical. So there's a number of different technologies, and it depends on the scale that the grower is working at. Uh, so one of the most common is hydrocooling, where you basically dip it into ice cold water. So this is a uh, conveyor belt that takes the box, takes it down into the ice cold water, and up it comes again. Really very simple, straightforward, not very expensive. You have to have access to gigantic blocks of ice at a low cost, but if you've got that, that's pretty good. One that lasts a lot longer is this liquid ice injection. So here the boxes are open. There's a dispenser, and it dispenses a bunch of chipped ice on top. That works great on a small scale, but doing those boxes one at a time uh, is high labor. Uh, one that we've seen that doesn't cool very much is just using the tap water or well water that's whatever the temperature of your groundwater is. Uh, that'll take a lot of the field heat out. So if you are delivering on the same day, it'll be cold enough as long as it gets sold within a day, you can get away with it. That's really cheap if you have that water available. Then cooling with solid ice, this is absolutely the cheapest one, the one everybody starts with, because all it takes is one of those plastic shovels and a box full of ice from the ice company. And you shovel the ice into the box one by one. Uh, very labor intensive. It costs a fortune per box. Uh, so for people starting out, they use that one. But the incentive to switch to something else uh, is quick. What they use in California, a um, huge scale, is it, actually not super cheap. But they have to do this to get it across the country. And that is they inject an ice water slurry into an entire pallet of boxes. 
And so the water ice mixture goes in there, it gets into every nook and cranny, and the water comes out. Um, so finally, I mentioned that it's hard to get market access for growers here, and it's hard for the markets to access the growers. And these are a bunch of the problems that people have run into. And we have a program going on in New York and a few other states in the East that is under the heading of Food Hub. And these are aggregation sites where there's a manager who will work with a number of different farms and consolidate shipments, uh, work with buyers who are used to calling up Salinas and saying, hey, I need two truckloads of this and that. Uh, that they'll be able to speak the same language as the buyers and be able to negotiate fairly among the growers uh, to meet, you know, it looks the way it should look, comes in the amount you promised, uh, it allows them to use cooling technology more efficiently. Uh, and so developing these food hubs is something that's moving along and we're having a great time working with the uh, Really, the extension system is where the strength is in this one. Uh, so the question now is, <laughs> can broccoli be as cool as kale? <laughs> uh, so uh, so that's, that's the last slide. So I've told you a little bit about the breeding and the physiology uh, and how we're taking that and how do you bring it to market so that the seed companies have an incentive to market to the eastern growers so that we can have a good base of eastern growers all the way from Immokalee uh, to the St. John River Valley in the north with, in particular, a nice big group in western New York where there's huge potential uh, for tens of millions of dollars of production in the next few years. So with that, thanks very much. Is there any interest in doing like the non-heading broccoli yeah. varieties? Uh, there are uh, non-heading broccoli varieties, but the labor cost in harvesting that is so high that uh, that is very limiting. And do they do wet better? I mean, are they like susceptible to the warm? No. The, the non-heading types have received much less breeding, so the quality Consistency is lower, the productivity is lower. Mm -hmm. Cost of fortune to harvest. Great for uh, market gardens and home gardens. Yeah. So, of all of those traits that you believe to be the most important, it's yeah. the domain that is the one that didn't really change. The domain is. Do you yeah. know? I mean, it stayed about the same. Right. Do you know any genes that control domain based on work and? Or yeah, so the, uh, so the flattening of the dome is when the uh, outer branches, the oldest branches, start to grow first as it's getting ready to bolt. It's getting closer to anthesis. Uh, those will start to grow. And the timing of that stem elongation relative to the maturity of the head uh, at that time is shifted. That's, that's what underlays it. So I don't know which genes control that for sure, but that's the, that's the timing event that's different. So, yes. A genetically complex trait, I'm sure. This seems like an obvious question, but are you working with any house growers or doing any trials in hoop houses? Uh, it doesn't seem like that's going to pay off for most markets because we can move up and down the coast. Uh, the, uh, the cost of producing broccoli in the hoop house uh, is so much higher than shipping it from a few hundred miles away, to, which is the distance that the hoop house would benefit. So for the non-heading types, there's actually some work in, uh, on the Atlantic seaboard for doing hoop houses with some of the non-heading ones. They can actually overwinter them, and so they work on, for a CSA, a restaurant, you can have those in very early spring, February. We have a we have a question from. Yeah, Thomas. Uh, what are other 
installed of the project in the next phase? So the major goals in the next phase of the project are actually easy to answer because I'm busy writing the current proposal right now. Uh, so we want to understand uh, the genetics of the complex traits better because to improve them further, uh, we're going to have to use molecular markers to identify the combinations because we're not going to get enough difference uh, between uh, single We'll call them you know, one one level of uh, genetic uh, tolerance from a high level. Just that stacking uh, because they're not single gene traits. I'm going to be careful about my terminology here. Uh, but to put more layers of that on, uh, we need to be using the molecular markers to see when we're combining uh, different sources of resistance. Uh, developing the uh, the food hubs actually a significant part of it because we need to make that volume grow and getting the, the new growers who might be uh, say tens to a hundred acres of broccoli uh, that kind of scale for their broccoli as part of their uh, vegetable mix uh, they're going to need the distribution channels and getting that regional Trialing system expanded to include a lot more seed companies, so there's more contribution to the overall uh, improvement of varieties. Those are, those are the areas that we're looking at uh, primarily for. Uh, in Thomas, in terms of carbon footprint, yeah, might it not be argued that trucking broccoli from Immokalee to New York or Boston is as carbon as flying it from California to New York? Well, the truck, well not as flying it, but trucking it. But trucking, yeah, if you're going, yeah, Immokalee to Boston or versus uh, Salinas to Boston, or actually the Yuma to Boston in that case, uh, it's not a huge difference because they're both big. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, going from Aristo County, Maine, to Atlanta, or going from Guanajuato mm -hmm. in Mexico to Atlanta. That's not really very different. Yeah. Uh, so you you do hit a uh, sort of breaking point there. And that's where Miguel Gomez's work has been modeling that as far as for each of the different major markets in the East, uh, how much should be supplied from East Coast but a distance for it to make sense. So they don't try to invest in something that really doesn't have very much potential because there's not that much local benefit. Yeah. I'm just curious about, is, is uh, spring or fall a better market, or is it, does it do better in spring or fall in this region? It does way better in the fall. Way better. Spring is really challenging because it wants to grow when it's warm, vegetatively, and it wants to head when it's cold. And that's the exact opposite of what happens in the spring. Time. So spring is really good. That's our most difficult season to find that out here. Well, I want to thank Thomas for a fascinating seminar. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.